awesome, awesome. I hope you had a good week. We start a new series today called Watch Your Lean, Watch Your Lean. And so uh, to begin this off, how many of you have ever struggled with vertigo, vertigo? Anybody, anybody struggled with vertigo just before? And I know sometimes that can be more chronic for some people, more acute. I've had, I've had some pretty significant bouts of vertigo and um, got, some, got some action, action coming down here. Um, I've had some uh, issues with vertigo in the past. And the thing that always catches me off guard is it's generally in the morning when I first wake up. And I don't know it, right? And I don't know how, how your experience has been, but then you get out of bed, and what immediately happens, right? The world's spinning, right? And so then, like a crazy person, or like maybe you've had too much the night before, but y'all don't do that because you're Christians, absolutely right, right? This is vertigo. So anyway, so you wake up, and then you try to grab onto something solid, right? You don't, you know, you, and what do you do? You grab the closest thing or person that's stable around you, right, that can, that, can, that can hold you up, right? And you grab whatever's close because the world's spinning. And then you lay back down, and it's terrible, and I would get nauseous and all this stuff. And so it's an absolutely horrible feeling physically, but there is a principle that we're going to talk about today that says actually something very similar often happens to us spiritually. It's that unforeseen, didn't know it was coming, knock you down, take you out, make you feel out of control, emotional, spiritual, mental feeling. Anybody here experienced that? That's right. And, it, and it's hard, isn't it, because you never see it coming, right? You know, it, it, we love to prepare, you know, I'm kind of a preparer or, you know, what. Well, on some things, a lot, of, a lot of other things I like to kind of see in my pants, but, but a lot of times, you know, when we, when we are prepared, we're like, I know it's coming, I know this thing is going to happen, it's like a test, I know it's going to be hard, and I'm studied, and I'm prepared, but man, when something takes you out, emotionally, spiritually, whether that's something that happens to somebody that you love, or a physical thing, or just an emotional thing, or somebody has done something, said something, and it just seems to pull the rug out from under us. And there's this principle that says that, you know, in life, we're either walking into, out of, or currently in a storm. That's the Christian language, isn't it? You know, you're in a, a storm, or you're in a valley, or you're in a dark place, you know, right? We want to be mountaintop people, right? Because what is the mountain? The view is great on the mountain. You know, you can see in front of you and beside you and behind you on the mountain, but in the valley, what is it? It's dark. It's scary. It's confusing. It's discombobulating. We don't know which way is up and down and left and right. And that's the thing about spiritual and physical vertigo is you don't know which way is up and down. You don't know which is side to side because your equilibrium is just thrown into chaos. And I think a lot of us have experienced that, or you may be experiencing that right now. And you don't have to be a, a Jesus follower to, to feel that. Many of you have just felt that just in normal life. Things happen that take us by surprise. And so then we often are having to then act in reaction of, not in preparation of, but in reaction of. And so what we're going to talk about in this series for the next just few weeks is, is this idea of the lean, that all of us have these things that when that happens spiritually, emotionally, mentally, that we have these things that we go to, that we lean to, that are often automatic, and they may be habits that we've developed or people that we lean on, right? That's what we say, like, you know, I need you, I need you to hold me up. I need to lean on you, right? I'm weak. I need to lean on something. And so your lean, that I've defined it here, is the direction that you naturally lean when life throws you off balance, because it will throw you off balance, doesn't it? You can, be, you can feel so secure. Matter of fact, that's usually when we're most vulnerable, right? You, ever, you remember that game when you were young and teenagers and, you know, and you'd stand here like this and somebody would come up behind you and hit your knees out from under you? It's always when, you, when your knees were locked and you were feeling real nice and secure. You know, if you're, if you're ready for it, they can't do nothing. And it wouldn't it be nice to live life like this. But no, usually we're, we're kind of like this. You know, looking around, it's, it's pretty good, right? And then something just comes in it. And it knocks us off balance. And so it's that direction that you naturally lean when life throws you off balance. And so if you don't hear nothing today, I want you to hear this. This is, this is the main point of this whole thing. To watch your lean, what you keep close is what you will grab when you need it most. There is a power in proximity when it comes to keeping your balance in life, spiritually, emotionally, mentally. So what you keep close is what you will grab when you need it most. 
And so when you get out of bed on one of those mornings and, and, your, and your equilibrium's all off, you will grab your nightstand or you'll grab the door frame or you'll fall back onto the bed. And so it's the same thing spiritually happens, emotionally happens. And so what I want to do to illustrate this today is I have here what many of us recognize, of course, as a cane. So here's the thing. I'm not, I'm not really trying to pick on anybody, but we just need to state fact. Is this a sign of strength or weakness? It's It's weakness. Because you don't, you don't really walk around with one of these unless you need it, right? Unless you need it. Maybe you're a little older. Maybe you've had an injury. And so what happens is, is we can kind of get used to spiritually, mentally walking with a cane. Because when something happens, you want to start leaning on things. We can have all sorts of leans. This cane can be all sorts of things. Maybe it's even something as, as, as good as and as simple as a good reputation, you know what? Even if I lose everything, I still got a good reputation, right? People still think highly of me. They think I'm something, right? I got a last name or I've done this or they, they look at me. I got, I got a good reputation. You know what the problem is with making reputation your lean? It's because even when we watch the perfect one, Jesus Christ, you know what? Sometimes his reputation wasn't that great to some people because he hung out with the wrong kind of people. So maybe your reputation isn't the best lean or maybe it's something as simple as you know what, every now and then I just got to go outside and you know, have a smoke or have a little bit of a drink. It's not, not a terrible thing, but that's just what I run to because I need something to just, just calm me down a little bit. I need something that I can just grab hold of, right? Or maybe it's, maybe it's the ability that you can still flirt with people at your work even though you're married because you still got what it takes, right? You still feel like other people may want you, right? And so you lean on that. So whenever you're feeling less than or you're feeling like life isn't going your way, well, you know what? I still got that. I still got all this, right? People still think I'm something. Still get somebody's motor running. Y'all laugh, but that's where it starts half the time. Don't act like y'all don't know. There can be all sorts of things that we lean on. But here's the thing. What you think is holding you up is holding you back. And that's powerful truth. Because all the while it can get, you can get real used to having this thing, whatever it is, and we can go on for hours, you know, because everybody's story is unique. And, and you know, maybe it's your money, maybe it is your influence, maybe it's your authority, maybe it's your power, maybe it's your parents, maybe it's, it's your accomplishments, maybe it's all of these things, maybe it's the car that you drive, maybe it's how good you look, it could be any of these things, but whenever life throws you off balance, you still think, well, at least I got that. Well, you know what? The problem with this lean is it's still not sure. Because all of those things can be taken from you too. So if you build your life off of the foundation of something that can still be taken from you, it's a poor foundation. I'm glad my house isn't built on sticks that can be kicked over by bare feet, right? I'm glad it's built into concrete, into strong soil, right? Matter of fact, there's a little song. How do, crap, I just, I just forgot it on stage. The wise man built his house. house, house there it is. A wise man built his house upon the rain. And when the rain came tumbling down. What happens? His house stood firm. Where are all the church people at? Y'all don't know that song? <laughs> We're starting Sunday school next week so y'all can learn these songs. I expect everybody here an hour early for Sunday school. Don't actually show up. I'm not showing up an hour early to teach y'all Sunday school. We'll just upload the video or Google it. So what you think is holding you up it's holding you back. So we want to talk about briefly today is this guy named David. Many of us know David and have heard of David and heard his stories. And we're not going to go into any specific details of his life. But let's just say that David had some really high highs, right? I mean, he had some really up there mountaintop experiences. I mean, from a young man, I mean, he, he was he was conquering giants, right? He was the giant slayer and he was anointed to be king. Matter of fact, how sweet of it. Uh, the, the young lady here preaching the gospel, man. God doesn't look at the outside. He looks at what? He looks at the heart. Where does that come from? David or man, right? Because he was overlooked by his own father, right? But no, God saw something different and unique. So from, a, from a young age, he was anointed as king by the prophet Samuel. But then, you know, it didn't always go so easy, did it? Because even though he had killed the giant, even though he had protected the king in his kingdom, 
You know, jealousy is a terrible thing. And so the king was jealous. And so David was run out of the same town and village that he was called and anointed to lead. Had to live in caves. Had to be pursued by his father-in-law and his best friend's daddy. He did not have great experiences all the time. And so we can read those stories, man. If you want to really be encouraged, read through David's stories and his life. But here's the thing that makes David so powerful to us, and I think why we hear about him so often in church world, is because not only do we have the narrative of his stories, but we have his thoughts. Because not only was David a a warrior and a king and a father and a husband, but he was a songwriter and a journaler. And so almost half of the book of Psalms is all written by David. And so what we're going to do today, and what we're going to do in this series actually, is we're going to start, we're going to break down one of the Psalms that I think honestly every one of us know. But there is something about familiarity that robs stuff of power. There's, there's this thing that I think happens in church world, and for most of us that did grow up, or a lot of us that grew up in church, or at least grew up in the proximity of church, which is basically all of us. That we hear things and we just go to a place because, and, and we, just because we've heard it so much. So we're going to talk today about Psalm 23. Psalm 23. Something that we know so well. I'm sure that most of you have it memorized in some form or fashion or at least have it close. But I think there's some power that is lost just because we're so comfortable with it. So I want to I want to look at this from a new perspective and a new angle. So we're not going to talk about the whole psalm today. You'll have to wait till the next few weeks to do this. But in Psalm 23, we learn about in the first few verses, we learn about three liens that David takes care of. Because David didn't write this psalm specifically and a lot of the ones he wrote about weren't just when things were great. He had plenty of those. He had plenty of celebrations and God is great and God is good type prayers and type, type songs. But he had some other ones that just straight up said, God, where are you? Because I'm sitting here and I don't think you're here with me. Why have you forgotten me? And so this is where we find ourselves in Psalm 23. So I want y'all to walk through with me. But remember, watch your lean. What you keep close is what you will grab when you need most. So we're going to find out what we're keeping close to today. Starting in verse 1, Psalm 23. The Lord is my... Oh yeah, y'all can preach this message yourself, right? The Lord is my shepherd. The first lean I want to talk about today is purpose. What is your purpose? You might say, well, Pastor, where are you going with purpose? Because all we know is the Lord is my shepherd. But here's the thing. I'm going to, I'm going to get you there. But this is what I want you to know. There are some questions that we ask when it comes to purpose. Because see, when life throws a curve at us, when life gets unstable and our equilibrium is thrown off, one of the things that we begin to question oftentimes for many of us is purpose. Why? What what am I here for? Who am I? Do I have any worth? Does God love me? Does he know that I'm here? Why am I still here? Because the reason this is powerful is because sometimes you can go to some seriously dark places when life throws you a curveball, can't you? You can go into some really dark places that honestly you wouldn't have seen yourself going. And the thing that you need to combat those is knowing your purpose. You need to know your purpose because if you don't know before you get there, you won't know how to answer that question when you are there. And it's dangerous. Um, I'm not going to try to use myself as an example too much in this, but I've recently gone through a, a pretty significant health and, and mental health uh, season. And guys, I'm a, I'm a pretty happy-go-lucky, believe-in-Jesus-obviously kind of guy. But let me tell you something. In the middle of the night, when you don't know what's happening and you can't find answers and you feel like you've pursued what you're supposed to have done and you still haven't gotten your problem fixed, you can begin to go to some pretty dark places. And you know what? All of those liens that you had before, you know what? I was no longer concerned about what kind of car I drove, to be honest, or what color my front door was painted, or what people on Facebook were saying. All I know is I was grabbing desperately to the promises of God. That God, do you still love me? Are you still here? And it's so easy to get up here and preach and say and read, but it's hard to feel and know sometimes. And we are emotional creatures. And we can get to some really pretty dark places pretty quickly 
And you need to know your purpose. You need to know your promises. You need to know what God has told you, what he has what he's promised you for, what he has set you here for. Why are you here? Why are you here? Why are you here? Why do you get up in the morning? Because if you're still breathing, God's not done with you. Amen. But it's not enough to just stop at that. You need to know, if he's not done with me then, what am I supposed to be doing? So here's, what, um, here's one of the things I want to talk about shepherd real fast. The Lord is my shepherd. Shepherd indicates closeness, care, protection. But here's the powerful thing. The shepherd gives value to the sheep by the length he is willing to protect them. By whatever cost he is willing to pay to protect the sheep. So if, let's, let's just pretend you were a shepherd and you were keeping sheep. The sheep's value would be decided upon how far you would go to protect them from predators, from robbers, from thieves. You would promote their value. If you weren't willing to protect them, what is their value? Nothing. Take the sheep. <laughs> Leave me alone. Take the sheep. But here's the thing. I want to, I want to read this. This is, this is a few verses here, so I need you all to keep up. I'm just going to kind of read through this whole thing without breaking it down. It'll be up on the side screens here. John 10, 7 through 14. This is so good. This is so good, and I know that Jesus was thinking this when he said this. This is what Jesus said. He's been talking. He's preaching. He's preaching to the Pharisees and some other people. It says that John 10, 7 through 14, or, or, or 9 through 14, rather. He says, I am the gate. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. Ooh, pasture. A thief comes only to kill, to steal and kill and destroy. But I have come that they might have life and life abundant. Well, how, Jesus, how can they have life abundant? How can these sheep that you speak of, who are these sheep, but how can they have this life abundance? And he says, I am the good shepherd. Oh, the good shepherd does what? Lays down his life for the sheep. Then he goes on. This is so good. He says, the hired hand, since he is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, leaves them and runs away when he sees a wolf coming. There are a lot of things that you're setting up in your life that you think is shepherding you that's just a hired hand that will abandon you as soon as something comes along that threatens it. Those false liens that you want to lean on, all of those things that aren't secure, you need to look at those as hired hands. They're no good to you in an emergency. The minimum wage guy ain't sticking around and is putting up his life for minimum wage, is he? No. But you're paying those things far more than they're worth, and they're not going to protect you. They're not going to stand there for you. You need to have more purpose than that. You have more worth. So this happens because he's a hired hand that doesn't care about the sheep. Whoo, what a strong line. But then Jesus says, but I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. So the good shepherd lays his life down. See, the thing is, is that when David wrote that, that, parag that, that phrase that we know so well, the Lord is my shepherd, he wrote that having no clue what that fully meant. He had, a, he had a hint, I think. I think the Holy Spirit was speaking to David in this powerful, spiritual way, how God does to us. But David still didn't really have a clue what that means. But we know. Because we know that when Jesus said this, he meant it, didn't he? That our good shepherd, as a matter of fact, maybe we need to change that. Maybe we should say, the Lord Jesus is my shepherd. You know, sometimes I think the Lord sounds a little too detached. No, Jesus is my shepherd. And my shepherd has laid his life down for his sheep. And when he calls my name, I know he knows me and I know him. So you know why I know I have worth? is because my shepherd has paid for me. And he didn't just pay silver and quarters and dollars. No, he paid for his life with his life for mine. And here's the thing. I'm just a sheep, but he paid for me. So you know what? I have worth. You have worth. Why? Not because you're good looking, not because you're smart, and not because you've done good at your job or you drive a nice car or live in a nice house or come from a good family. It's because Jesus has paid for you. That gives you worth. None of the other stuff does. That's hired hand stuff. Jesus is my shepherd. 
And my shepherd has laid down his life. So here we go. Purpose, number one. When you get to a place and you don't know your purpose, always start here. This is where you start. I can't discover your purpose up here for you because that's between, honestly, between you and God. Why did he make you? Why did he put you here? But here it is. To know who you are, you must know whose you are. I'm pretty sure that's correct English. Any, 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 any grammar, grammar people out there, is that right? Thumbs up? Sure? Sure? Perfect. Okay. To know who you are, you must know whose you are. So here's the real question. To whom do you belong? Have you given it to Jesus? Have you given it to him? Or are you still living your life being ruled by hired hands that don't care and that will abandon you? I'm about to pry real fast and I'm moving on. Some of those hired hands might be people in your life that you think have good things for you but are just using you until you're used up and they'll abandon you too. And some of you, that's where your hurt's coming from and you can't find your purpose. Stop putting your purpose in people who will hurt you. Put it in a person who paid for you, who died for you, and who loves you. All right, we'll keep going. 23, verse 1. We ain't even finished verse 1, folks. Y'all need to hurry up. All right, the Lord is my shepherd. And here's the thing. This is super, super important. I really want to say the Lord, or maybe we say the Lord Jesus is my shepherd. I want y'all to read that every time you come through this now. The Lord Jesus is my shepherd. But then he says this. I have what I need. Now, before we go anywhere, most of us memorized it another way, didn't we? It says, the Lord is my shepherd, and what? I shall not. All right, yeah, so here's the thing. So that's the New King James Version. Love that version. It's super poetic, but I do think for, for me personally, and I think for us, I actually like this other one. I have what I need better, because here's the thing. When I come to, this is just personal, but maybe it's you too. When I come to, I shall not want. That feels like I'm just having to discipline myself to stop wanting things, right? Like I'm having to pull back. But here's the thing. Sometimes it's not, what I, I, it's not me trying to get what I want. Sometimes I don't have what I feel like I need, right? So there's something about a discipline aspect, but actually coming to a contentment place. And so I think what we need to start saying instead is, listen, Lord, the Lord Jesus is my shepherd, and I have what I need. Say, I have what I need. I have what I need. Because here's the thing. This is what need says. Number two, need. Will there ever be enough? I think the second one's powerful. How do I dream when I can barely survive? See, it's easy to get in here and talk about big things and all that and, and feel, get kind of pumped up like this is some kind of concert experience thing and get all emotional. I'm all for that, man. I love it. I love what we do. I love church. I love people. But you know what? Then I got to go home and pull up my bank account, right? And then reality hits, right? And so, you know, the preacher's talking about big dream and do this, and God can do all sorts of things. You're like, well, you know what? My dollars and cents don't go very far these days. So sometimes it isn't just about what I want. I barely have what I need. But here's the thing. David did not write this as a king. He more than likely wrote this in a cave. He didn't write it sitting on a throne in a palace because you know what? It's easy to say that there. It's actually easy to say, and I shall not want, right? Like you already made it there. Like you already got it, right? You're living up in the house now. You own the comfy bed with the memory foam mattress, right? You've made it. I got, I shall not want anymore, right? But no, no, when you're in the cave, when you're in the hard place, when there's barely gas money left to put gas in your car, sometimes that's when you need to say, but you know what? I still have what I need. I do not have everything I want. I can assure you. That want bucket can fill up fast, and it can be deep. But I know that there's a principle that when I really look at it, I can say, you know what? My God has not let me down yet. He always didn't come through in the way I hoped he would or expected him, but he hasn't let me down yet. See, Paul had a thought on this too. I love tying Old Testament stuff to New Testament stuff because I really do think that these authors, Paul knew his scriptures really, 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 really well, right? And he had all this stuff memorized. They usually had the entire Old Testament memorized in Paul's day. So um, we're a little behind on that. But this is what he writes in prison. This is what he writes to a church that had recently given, given him a gift Starting in Philippians 4, verses, verses, uh, starting in verse 10, he says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly, because once again 
you renewed your care for me. He says, man, thank you guys so much that y'all thought about me because I'm in a hard place. He says, you were in fact concerned about me but lacked the opportunity to show it. So, man, I'm just even thankful for the thought. He said, but I don't say this out of need. Like, what do you, you talk about, Paul? Brother, you can't even leave that room. If anybody has need, it's you because you don't have anything left to give us. That's why we're sending you the gift. But then he says, for I have learned to be content. I hate that word. I, just, I have learned to be content in whatever circumstance I find myself. <laughs> Man, that's making it hard on us. But then, I love this too, because this is why I wanted to, to flip the script, if you will, from I have what I, I shall not want to I have what I need. Because here's Paul. They're sending him a gift, right? But Paul, because he understands this principle, because you know what the reality is? He's thankful for the gift, but he'd have been okay without it. And you need to get to that place. That's what contentment looks like. You can be thankful, but you can also be okay without it. You can thank the Lord for the things that you have, but you know what? You can also be okay with the things you don't have. And you know what? Even if your neighbor has them. Because here's the thing, you don't want to be stuck in that trap because I'm not sure that maybe your neighbor is as content as they should be. So I'd rather have less and be content than have more and be miserable. Because listen here, we live, whoo, we live in a miserable world. But then this is what he says in verse 19. And he says, my God and my God will supply what? All your needs, he says, chained up in a room in prison with nothing. But I know that my God will and I know that he can according to his Riches in glory in Christ Jesus. See, Paul flipped the script. So here's the thing. This is what you need to remember. I know I'm talking, talk, saying a lot, but here it is on the back screen. God is more interested in the contentment of your life than the content of stuff in it. Significantly more. AKA, God does not look on the outside, but he looks at the heart. So I know, I know. I know as much as I could that I think this is where Paul was going in his mind. That you know what? The Lord is my shepherd and I have what I need. It, my need to you may look like I have nothing but, or, or where I am. But you know what? You can still be at a place and say, I have what I need. Let's keep going. Psalm 23, 1, now to verse 2. We've only gotten to verse 2. The Lord is my shepherd, I have what I need. He makes me lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside still waters. So the third lean that we want to lean to. See, the first, so, so let's, let's backtrack real fast. One was purpose. So we often go, two is need. We want to lean on the things that we think we need, right? And the third one, and this is a big one, especially in American culture, security. Security. I want to feel safe. I want to feel protected. I want to feel like there's a net to catch me, right? You know, we want to be tra trapeze artists, but make sure there's a really good net underneath us, right? I want to go for it as long as there's a buffer to stop me if I fall, right? I want people around me, whether that's parents, whether that's, you know, uh, you know social systems, whatever it is, you know, whether it's insurance, whether it's retirement, we want to be buffered, right, don't we? We want to be protected and padded in our culture because why? I want to feel safe. Security is a big one. Matter of fact, I think a lot of us, this may actually be where we go first, but I'm following along with the verse. I think a lot of us in today's culture, we're so scared of the unknown that many of us in this room right now are crippled by fear and anxiety. And these are the questions. Am I safe? Is my family protected? Can I let my guard down? Can I be confident of the future? It's the fear you feel. I never understood this is having kids. It's the fear you feel in a weird way every time your kids get sick. It's the what if. And you know what? The internet and Google has not helped any of that at all. I feel so bad for medical professionals in here when our, us patients come in and, like, and the first words are, well, I've Googled my symptoms. And according to WebMD, I am pretty sure I'm dying right now. So it isn't so much that I feel bad, I'm just pretty sure that you need to make sure that I'm not dying because I think I am, right? You know, it's always, it's always the worst thing. Matter of fact, this is no, no kidding, no kidding. 
Um, this is an article that was floating around on Facebook, and some of y'all, some of y'all perpetuate this stuff. I don't know who you are. I don't want to point anybody out, but y'all need to stop this crap. But I saw somebody share a thread that said, have itchy skin, it may be cancer. My skin itches all the time. And I'm not trying to make low, because that, that, is a, that is a horrible disease. And we have a lot of people that are walking through this, and we walk with people in our church family that have that. But listen here, that just perpetuates what? Fear. Am I secure and am I safe? Because I want to have that. You know, in a weird world, we read this stuff now with David, and David never knew what that kind of security felt like because he was constantly being chased and pursued for his life by real people. His father-in-law threw a spear at him at supper one time. I don't think any of you have ever had that happen. If so, change your Christmas plans. <laughs> but here's the thing. Do not lean on and trade over what God has called you to do and who he's called you to be because the reality is we are all dying. And I'm not trying to be morbid. And this is easy to say up here and it's hard to grapple with. But you need to make sure that you're saved from the real death, which is separation from your creator, and not the temporary things because we're all going to end up there anyway unless he comes back first. And no, no, I don't want any of our time cut short, of course. And I want all of us to live healthy and full and complete lives, of course. That's what all of us want. But fear and anxiety of tomorrow robs you of your potential. It traps you and it cripples you. But this is what Jesus had to say about that. We're actually going back to John 10, verses 27 to 29. He's talking about the sheep again. He says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. So you need to pay attention to what you're listening to because you might be listening to the voice of fear, a hired hand again, that's whispering lies to you to rob you of what God would have you to do because sometimes the greatest tra uh, tragedy or trial to come your way may actually be turned around to your greatest triumph that God can use for his kingdom. And that's really easy to preach, but that's also a powerful truth because I've seen it happen. I see it all the time. Somebody's greatest pain turns out to be their greatest leverage point for the kingdom of God. And that's a big deal. So God may be sending you into something or keeping you in a place so that you can learn something or that you can, you can take something with you that other people may need from you in the future. And so don't rob them of what God would have for them through you because you're so scared and crippled by fear. Don't do it. God doesn't promise you everyday security and that you will always be healthy, wealthy, and well. But he does say this. He says, but I give them, verse 28, eternal life. So we're going to look back on this as just a blink, as a shadow. And they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. See, here's the thing. You can live confidently because Jesus has conquered. And how did he conquer? Well, this goes all the way back to, verse, to the first point. It's because Jesus gave you purpose by paying the ultimate price. See, we want a king to come in and, and rescue us through violence to take over the things that we see wrong. But Jesus instead says, you don't understand what's actually wrong. I came to defeat death, and then to do it, I had to go through it, and I did it for you and for me. See, death is defeated. And I'm not talking about just physical death. So we're still having to put up with the repercussions of our sin and of our, and of our rebellion as a race and as a people. But that is not the end. It was never intended to be the end. God is making something new. The greatest event in human history has already happened. And we get to be a part of that. So when I am weak, I can live confidently. When I'm confused or when I'm angry or when I'm lost or when I'm broken or hurting or lonely, I can know that I have a purpose, 
that I have security in Jesus and that I have what I need, that he makes me lie down in green pastures. That's a place of, of peace and security. You don't lay down unless you know you are in good hands, right? Well, you are in the best hands when you are a sheep of the good shepherd. You can live confidently. So here's the thing. Watch your lean. What you keep close is what you will grab most. So what I want to do to wrap this up is... I do not expect y'all to write these down because there's a lot of words. And so they're going to be on, they're on the website. You can go to mycornerstone.me slash uh, message notes, I believe it is, or just go to the website there, mycornerstone.me, and you can swipe over until you find message notes. Because one of the things that I have found valuable and I have learned from other great pastors and leaders and fathers and different things is you need to oftentimes, especially when you're in a dark place, you need to have some declaration, things that you're going to declare over you. And I'm not talking about declarations like, you know, I'm going to have that thing that I want. No, 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 no. You need to declare the truth about you, who you are, what you have, and who holds you. And so I'm going to have three, I'm going to have some declarations on these three things, purpose, need, and security. So they're going to be up on the screen behind me, but I want you to own this. I would love for you to copy them down later on your own time, or you can go to the website now as I'm reading them and copying them down and put them in your notes or whatever. And maybe you need to make your own because this is not an exhaustive list, but the power of declaration over your life of the truth of God, of who you are and who, what he has done is powerful. So here it is. When I feel like I have no purpose. I will declare that I have been fought for. I have been purchased for a price. I have value because he has chosen me. My identity is in Jesus. I have a new name. I can be who he has created me to be. Finally, I have a calling and a purpose. I am here for a reason, and that reason is discovered in relationship with him. You have a purpose. If you're still breathing, he's not done with you. Don't ever believe that lie that you're purposeless. When I feel like I don't have what I need, I am well taken care of, I declare. My father knows what I need and when I need it. There is always more to be had in his hands. And he gives not just what I need, but blesses me with the desires of my heart when he sees fit. When it's good for me. I can think big because the resources of my father's house is much. He never runs out and he is generous. And I can dream big and do much. And lastly, when I want to feel secure, I declare that I am protected, that he sees me, he heals me, he watches over me, and he fights for me. Greater is he than the sum of all of my enemies. I can truly rest knowing that, that who is in control will always be in control and it will never be me. The one who created all is currently making this right for both me and through me. Lastly, I can move forward with confidence. And this is our declaration today. Woo, Jesus. I feel and I hold no shame. I hold no bitterness, fear, or anger. But instead, because of who Jesus is and what he's done, instead I hold hope, I hold love, I hold sureness, and I hold peace. I can love without requirement, and I can serve without return, knowing that what is in front of me is greater than what will be behind me. I have purpose, I have what I need, and I have security because Jesus is for me. So I don't know where you are and I don't know what you're going through and I don't want to just get you pumped up for the next hour I need you to take this home I need you to speak to the darkness listen if you're in a place open up the Psalms you read through the book of Psalms some of these nights that I've been in the darkest places you can ask my wife I have put on my version Bible app I have put on the audio portion of it and I've listened to that until I went to sleep because sometimes there is nothing that can quiet our unsteady spirits except for the voice of the truth so I don't know what you need to do or where you are, but you need to pursue that. Don't sit back. Chase it. Because Jesus, our shepherd, is for you. Let's stand.
Everybody, is eyes closed and head bowed just for a second. If you are not in relationship with Jesus Christ, I want to give you that opportunity right here, right now. And what that means is it's nothing hocusy pocusy or anything weird or strange. It is you declaring before the God of the universe who put it all together, who holds it together, and who made you. And he has purpose for you, and he has, a, he has dreams for you, and he wants you to do what you were created to do and to be who you were intended to be. And so that happens through declaring with your voice, and believing in your heart that Jesus is God. And you can just quietly repeat after me if you've never prayed that before and say, Jesus, I declare that you are my Savior and that you are King of both this world and the universe that you created. I confess that I have fallen short of your standard. I don't even know what that means or in what areas I have, but I just know that I have. And I ask you to come in and rescue me, save me, and make me new. I want your purpose. I want you to meet my needs. And I want your security. In Jesus' name. If you pray that prayer for the very first time, there's something about the physical act of, of moving or raising your hands. So everybody else's eyes is closed. I really want to cement this moment for you. This is really for you because I'm not going back and tallying this. I can't count them that fast. But with everybody's eyes closed, if you pray that prayer for the very first time, I'd love you to throw your hand up on the count of three. One, two, three. Throw your hands up if you pray that for the very first time. That is the best decision that you would ever made because let me tell you something. He holds your heart now and he will never let you go. And he recklessly loves you and he does not abandon you. Let's continue to pray. Jesus, thank you so much for this opportunity to speak before your congregation, to this church. Lord, anybody that is going through a dark season, Lord, we speak to that darkness, to that fear, to that worry, to that anxiety, to those false liens that are holding us up, Lord. We say be broken and be done away with in the name of Jesus. You hold no power, and you're a hired hand that does not care. And so instead, Jesus, we look to you, our good shepherd who has paid the ultimate price, but has come out on the other side victorious in life, forever, seated at the right hand of the Father, and we will see you there in Jesus' name. Amen.